Good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming to this 3 p.m. talks program. My name is Libby Sellers. I'm a design curator and writer, normally based in London, but for the last 18 months I've been based on Zoom, like most of us. Um, so it's a real honor to be here in real life with you all today. Uh, and uh, all thanks to Maria Cristina Didero and the Salone de Mobile for the invitation. As a curator and a writer, my stock in trade is ideas and words. And in preparing for this talk, I search for some of the more positive ideas and words that have come out of the last 18 months. Compassion, resilience, support, collaboration, networks, communication, sharing, though obviously not sharing a virus, but sharing of resources. And it's with that in mind that I wish to introduce today's talk, Foundations Between Design and Charity, for which I have the privilege to spotlight three individuals uh, and their respective teams and interests who are bringing resilience, compassion, support, collaboration and resources to the design community. I'll introduce them each in turn, but very quickly, we have Cyril Gutsch joining us remotely from New York, I believe, Nadja Shirovsky, who will also be joining us remotely via, from London, and with us today, fortunately, I have one fellow speaker on stage with me, Shireen mcgravy -Tayev. Each of our speakers bring a very nuanced response to this idea of design-based philanthropy, but they are changing not only the careers of individuals, but, bring, but bringing a healthier, more sustainable, and more global approach to design, and a community together based around that. Design, or at least good design, is about problem solving, be that at one end of the scale a very specific visual, technological, material, or even just aesthetic uh, solution. And at the other end, there's a societal, or humanitarian, or environmental solution. So in that sense, design is very well placed in this conversation today. And indeed, designers who don't work in a vacuum um, have collaboration at the very heart of their practice. So there's nothing new there. But what is new, and therefore does need highlighting, is how traditional approaches to the philanthropy to, through, to support and charity-based uh, collaboration are being abandoned. Foundations, small businesses, even government grants, large corporations are putting altogether the brakes on donation-based support systems, believing that they don't produce enough business or social results. Instead, the philanthropic turn is recognizing the need for a more holistic approach to enhancing education, health, work opportunities, environmental concerns, and human rights. It's a systemic change. It's an investment in the socio and environmental capital. I've asked each of the speakers if they could uh, talk for up to 10 minutes. I'm going to be quite strict on that, speakers. Uh, give a short presentation about their foundation uh, or their interests, and then we'll have a group conversation afterwards. So my first speaker, Cyril, whom I'll quickly introduce, is an award-winning designer and uh, brand and product developer. In 1998, he created a method called cross-intelligence, which was to bring together a culture of collaboration to major organizations. But in 2012, almost 10 years ago, he decided to focus on a new client, the oceans. It's a vital client for all of us. And in such, he founded Parley for the Oceans, as a collaboration network for creators, thinkers, and leaders to raise awareness for the beauty and fragility of the seas and to develop and implement strategies that can end their destruction. Now, he speaks much better about this than me, so I'm going to hand over through the wonders of technology and hope that Cyril will be able to join us now. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm not sure I speak better about it, but I can try. Um, the situation that we're in, and that led also to ultimately to um, starting Palais for the Oceans, is that the way we create things, the way we consume, the way we discard, the way we are living on this planet as a species, um, 
is coming to an end. Because we always assumed that on one side, I guess we don't, we never really felt that we could have such a big impact on the environment. We still have this like program in our mind that we have to survive, that we have to master these like big forces, that, these big predators that we found when we arrived on this planet. And then in the last 50 years, we optimized our way of survival, our way of optimizing, our way of sharing tasks to a level that becoming, that we are becoming the biggest threat to the natural world, to exactly that planet that allows us to be here, that produces, that creates the chemistry that gives life, that allows life. And at Palais, or what led to Palais, the belief was that we said, we have to stop exploiting. We have to stop actually assuming that we can do whatever we want, take whatever we want and discard what we don't need. We have to kind of become collaborators with nature. And that means that we have to understand the complexity and respect the complexity of how this planet is functioning, how the ecosystems are working. When you translate that to design, then this is something which is, I would say, a normal job description of, this, of a designer. You try to understand a complex situation, you, you, you break it down to a simple solution, and you have to speak a universal language. You have to inspire all the people that you're depending on, that are delivering um, all the components that you have to put into a design. And if you are stretching the definition of design towards identity, towards product concepts, towards even business models, right? If you're stretching it that far, then you understand that you can't do anything alone. You are more or less a curator. And I think a great designer is a collaboration manager, really. Somebody that empowers others to contribute to a vision. And I would say this, um, the time before we started Palais, working with big industry, working with governments, working with famous individuals helped us to be very focused on an outcome. And then in 2012, I learned from an environmentalist, Captain Paul Watson, that it, pretty much in our lifetime, the oceans might die. Um, it triggered something. And, and I called my partner in New York and we said, listen, we have to deploy our skills towards a very a bigger task, a bigger challenge than fame, um, design awards and money, right? And technically it's the same work. You are looking at systems, you're looking at existing business models, and honestly, economy is the driver of all the damage, right? All the environmental issues we're facing today is caused by uh, economic flaws. And you can break it down to design flaws. Like, how are we using ingredients? How are we designing products? What use cases are we supporting, suggesting, seducing people to accept and adopt? And all this leads to the idea that if you unite enough people and you create examples, you create showcases, you create a strategy and you prove that strategy to be successful, then you can turn things around. You can establish a new economy, one, there, one that is not based on exploitation. And that has two angles. One is our relationship to the natural world and the other one is our relationship to other, pe to other people, to humans. And if you exploit people, how can we expect that we can together protect our future? So there is a certain, I would say, mindset shift that has to happen from ego tactics towards collaboration, from old technology, old materials to new technology, eco-innovation as we call it. And that is pretty much the basic um, of the Palais Foundation and the, Palais, the work at Palais. And Palais is, is a tandem of a private organization, uh, actually a for-profit and a non-for-profit. So we're working in, in pretty much all territories. And today we are collaborating with brands, um, probably have seen our work with Adidas, uh, American Express, or Anna Busch InBev, or lots of fashion brands we're working with, but then also with governments. Um, we have a big partnership with the World Bank. Um, there are like 10 countries, Palais members right now, uh, and the number is going up. We're collaborating with the United Nations. Lots of other artists also, like creators, designers, all around the world. And the idea is to install 
or I would say um, to manifest and to prove um, a formula. And the formula is called AIR, avoid, intercept and redesign. We believe that we can end plastic pollution, we can end climate, the climate crisis and the fishing crisis with a simple formula if it's applied in a very, I would say, nearly radical way. And this formula is called AIR, avoid, intercept, redesign. And for plastic means avoid plastic where it's possible. Intercept that trash from nature and don't let it out there. And the R in AIR is redesign the material itself. Let plastic go, let toxic materials go and, and open a new material age. And it's the same thing can be applied to carbon. Avoid carbon emissions where possible. Intercept carbon emissions and use them as a resource. And redesign the cause, the origin of these emissions. So there is, I would say, a need for A, a strong strategy, but then also examples, showcases that led to success, where people can say, oh, this is not an abstract theory from somebody who is like far away from reality. This is actually proven. And that's our attempt. Our attempt is to deliver these showcases um, and to work with, with um, these organizations that want to become a champion in this area to prove that changing the way things are being done doesn't mean sacrifice per se. It means investment, yes, but it can be easily rewarded with financial success or economic success of a country or uh, a higher quality of life, etc. And I think it's important to understand that um, no one organization, not Palais, nobody will solve these problems. It's all based on collaboration. We all just have to kind of contribute. And a big aspect of, of that, I would say, the most promising aspect probably of our work is the youth, right? I mean, we can try to change adults and people that are leaders, CEOs, shareholders, presidents of countries. Uh, and we are, we are working hard to doing so the last nine years. Um, but then there are kids and kids are faster. I mean, uh, I just got an email this weekend from uh, a daughter of a good friend of mine, and she was in one talk three years ago, one Palais talk. And now she's like, she came back and she said, okay, my whole, my, my whole career plan, my, my, my whole orientation in life is based on what I learned back then. I, I kept being curious, I kept digging. And, and she's like, not only um, going into the environmental mo uh, movement with her profession, or her career planning, but she's also like starting a chapter in her school, like getting her, the other students to support Palais, you know, and it doesn't have to be of course Palais, it's any, there are so many good organizations out there. What I want to say with that is that inspiring and empowering people pays out, mm -hmm. right? And you never know what is happening, what is the, the outcome, but you have to keep pushing. So I stayed under my 10 minutes um, and yeah, thank you. We'll come back to you at the end, Cyril. Thank you very much. Um, so now, actually, to a collaborator of Cyril's, Nadia Shirovsky, whom I'm sure will explain her relationship with Palais. Uh, I'm sure many of you will recognize the name Nadia Shirovsky, as she was the first female member of the executive board of Shirovsky, the, found, uh, the company that was founded in Austria by her great-great-grandfather, Daniel, in 1895. And her career in the family business really started, I guess, in the mid-1990s. Uh, but uh, doing projects such as the Shirovsky Collection and Runway Rocks, all initiatives which supported and celebrated emerging and established talents, both in the fashion, design, and architecture worlds. And in 2002, Nadia launched the Shirovsky Crystal Palace, which many of you who have been coming to Milan as long as I have might remember a visionary program that really pushed the boundaries of lighting and design through creative collaborations with people including Ron Arad, Zaha Hadid, Todd Bunchi, Toshigen Yoshioka, Ross Lovegrove, Tom Dixon, etc., etc. But more recently, Nadia has been channeling her very, very dynamic creative talents into the Shirovsky Foundation, a UK charity that she established in 2013 which focuses on supporting creativity, supporting uh, human empowerment, and preserving the environment. And a new initiative, Creatives for Our Future, aims to help identify and accelerate the next generation of design creative leaders. 
and it was devised with the United Nations Office for Partnerships and seeks to empower young creatives to design new solutions to global and sustainable challenges. So please will you welcome and please can we have Nadja. Welcome Nadja. Libby, thank you so much and I so was looking forward to seeing you in person. I'm so disappointed, but um, at least modern technology allows us to be together. So this is wonderful and it's an honor to be here, especially with the fellow speakers who are amazing, who I really admire and appreciate so much. And I, so many of the words of Cyril just totally echo uh, what my beliefs are, but also that of the Swarovski Foundation. And you've said so much already about what the foundation is. I just wanted to give a little bit of a background to everyone here. So if we could move to the next slide, please. Um, Okay, it really, you know, Libby, we've been doing so, we've been collaborating so much uh, with the various different industries, whether it's fashion, architecture, design, jewelry, and so on. And, you know, I just realized uh, it was actually my great great grandfather, Daniel Swarovski, who had such a strong sense of philanthropy. And, uh, you know, he built up this business from scratch. He was an immigrant from Bohemia um, and built his crystal factory in Tyrol. And um, he just realized, you know what, it doesn't matter how great his idea is, he needs people to make this vision into reality. So he's always been incredibly um, social, communal, collaborative. Um, and as his business grew into success, it was really important for him to give back, give back to the community. You know, he had a he created the uh, cycling society, the music club, he created the canteen, he had a housing system, a bonus system. None of these things existed at all in society or were encouraged by governments. It was really his own, which we might consider the norm today, but that was really uh, very innovative um, at his time. And back then he just really appreciated how important that human interaction was. So the foundation is really based on that philosophy and we wanted to make sure that the relationships that we have with different organizations, it's not a sponsorship, but it is truly a collaboration. So if we could go to the next slide, please. We made sure that we really identify the three pillars that the foundation is gonna be focused on. Uh, we chose partners that are very like-minded and um, also create some kind of a synergistic situation with Swarovski's philosophies. Um, and here you have them listed, as you mentioned earlier, culture and creativity, uh, human empowerment. 90% of Swarovski customers are women. So it's really important for us to address this topic, address female equality um, around the globe, whether it's in emerging countries or first world countries, you know, they're ripe subjects and uh, topics everywhere. Um, but we really are trying to tackle that subject with education. We feel by educating people, you are empowering them. Knowledge is power. And so the various organizations that we support really um, do educate in particular young children and set them on the right path. And then of course, environment is the third pillar. So important to us. Swarovski comes from the Tyrolean Alps. We honor and cherish the environment, the Alps, the water that we have surrounding us. And uh, we've certainly tried very hard to also be um, sustainable in our manufacturing. So we have, uh, we're a member of the Responsible Jewelry Council, for example, with the crystal manufacturing, the gemstone manufacturing, now also the jewelry manufacturing. And, you know, as Seal was mentioned earlier, companies can do it. The solutions are here. It's a matter of the will implementing the will to produce um, in a more sustainable way. Um, but more to that a little bit later, I just wanted to show you our trustees. Um, the foundation, if we could go to the next slide, please. The foundation is a UK charity. And um, our trustees are rather international, though we could be a little bit more internationally. Though it's, it's a continuous evolution, evolution and growth. And um, the trustees really also represent the various different areas where we're trying to have an impact. You know, Dean Terry Schwartz from uh, University of um, UCLA. She was the Dean of the film department. Uh, Jonathan Bailey um, is a big environmentalist, um, having been the chief scientist of National Geographic and so on. We're so incredibly proud of these trustees that are very knowledgeable, very intelligent, but really also have their heart in the right place. And it's been such joy to work with them. And if we go to the next slide, um, you know, of course we always have to measure ourselves no matter 
what field you're in, business, philanthropy, and you just have to measure and make sure you're on the right track and um, course correct. And, you know, we always strive for the highest impact, but we are just happy that the foundation is a platform to have a positive impact on people. So with the foundation, we've reached 600,000 people globally. We also have a water school that's active in Africa, China, India, North America, South America, where we are specifically educating children about the use of water. And ironically enough, as these children are learning about water, they become really empowered. They feel empowered because they're realizing that they as an individual can truly contribute positively to the environment. They matter. And as we say, every drop counts. So if we go on to the next slide, I just wanted to show everyone here what the goals are. I'm sure the room here knows the 17 goals established by the UN. We have used those 17 goals as the anchor um, for the path of the Swarovski Foundation. And if we go to the next slide, we really see here um, the eight goals that Swarovski is really striving for. No, no poverty, quality education, gender equality, clean, clean water, decent work and economic growth, life below water, life on land. And of course, it's the partnerships back to the collaboration that we heard Libby talk about and um, Cyril. And just to give you a little snapshot of um, what were the organizations we're working with in culture and creativity, um, it's, you know, it was really important for everyone here. If we go to the next slide, please. To see the faces, we are dealing with people. We are continuously interacting. Uh, we are um, helping people advance their lives, you know, and often the contribution is a tiny contribution, but the impact is huge. And we also like to say money is not the only currency. It's the ability to connect people with each other, with other organizations to enable the, the knowledge sharing. Okay, and then the next slide, we see uh, the initiatives in human empowerment. Um, and then I'm just gonna speed up a little bit, environment. We're so proud of our um, all the partners there and the work that they're doing, so inspirational. And as Cyril kept on uh, mentioning is the solutions are there, we just have to do it and we have to be committed. So if we go to the next slide, uh, besides those pillars, what we have also established is an emergency and an action fund. So it's an extra pot of money that we have available to be able to react quickly to various crises going on. So the last crisis was the Yemen appeal, um, sorry, was the Afghanistan appeal, where we're working with women for women. I mean, it's absolutely disappointing to see what's happening in, in Afghanistan. We've been supporting women there. Um, for five years and you know we continue to support what's happening there and again it just makes you realize we are so lucky we're so fortunate to be living in the western world we have freedom we have freedom of speech we have freedom to move and act and implement ourselves in a positive way to have a positive impact um, if we move to the next slide and this is um really why we're here today is to talk about the creatives for the future so this is a evolution of the Swarovski Foundation where, you know, um, we are, we have reached out to uh, young individuals between 18 and 25 um, uh, with the aim to empower that generation of creative talent to unlock innovative new approaches to our global sustainability challenges and drive progress towards the UN goals. So, you know, it's exactly what Seal was saying. There's so many different materials out there with which we can work that are environmentally friendly. It really requires a different thinking. And we see that that different thinking is with that young generation. So we're truly empowering them, we're embracing them. And so what this program does, uh, we have created a fantastic group of advocates. If we could go on to the next slide, please. Um, uh, the next slide. Okay, so here are the advocates. And as I'm sure you recognize some of the faces here, we have Eve Behar, Greg Lynn, um, uh, Craig Robbins, uh, Lily Holland, who I'm sure all will be in Milan, but uh, just to name a few. So these are our wonderful mentors from the design community. Then we have the fashion community, Philip Lim, Parabel Guru, they're leaders in their field in terms of um, working in sustainable ways to create fashion throughout the entire supply chain. And Cyril is also one of our mentors. We're so honored, Cyril. Um, it's amazing the impact that you have. Your passion is so contagious. And this is what we want to give to 
our students. So if we go on to the next slide, here we have the nine students uh, from nine different countries focused in different subjects matters from textile design, footwear design, fashion, engineering, and, um, you know, our product, the products that they have developed will be launched at the end of the month at the UN uh, General Assembly. The UN is our partner for this project. And um, we just can't wait to see what these young minds come up with. And to summarize it all, I wanted to show you a very short video which really talks about this program, The Creatives of Our Future. So if we could show the video, please, that'd be great. Creatives are the thinkers, the doers, and the dreamers. Swarovski is rooted in engineering and design and has empowered young talents across borders and mediums. The Swarovski Foundation supports culture and creativity, innovation and education to address human rights, environmental issues, inequality, and increasing threats to health and well-being. The future is now. We must start thinking in generations. The Swarovski Foundation Institute Creatives for Our Future program seeks young sustainability trailblazers across creative disciplines with unique problem solving and critical thinking abilities to design new pathways for a better world. The program cohort will receive financial support, one-on-one -on -one mentors, and learn from master teachers. They will also join industry leaders at global forums and develop their practice, technology, or network to make groundbreaking ideas a reality. We believe in the power of young creatives to lead sustainable development and reinvent our future. Thank you. We'll come back in a, in a few minutes, well, in 10 minutes. To my final speaker, who joins me on the stage, Shireen mugrabi Tayeb, an entrepreneur and businesswoman, a brave woman to deal with all the transport issues to be here with us in Milan, a creative and communications director of Magrabi Opticals, the family firm in Lebanon, but is here today to discuss her role as founder and director for the not-for-profit organization House of Today. In the absence of any kind of state support, Shireen recognized that the only way Lebanese design would manage to become more than just a crafts movement uh, was by giving local designers, local Lebanese designers, a helping hand. And so House of Today works hand in hand with designers by mentoring, curating and showcasing their work, offering scholarships, sponsorship and connecting them with the wider world. As we all might remember, though, August last year, a terrible explosion rocked through the central core of Beirut, which was unfortunately exceptionally close to the main creative industry hub of the city. Uh, so House of Today, in response, uh, turned their hand to, uh, to providing urgent care need and support. But I'm not going to steal all of Shireen's thunder, and I'm going to hand over to your presentation now, please. When I moved to Beirut a few years ago, I was looking for local talents to work with. I noticed that Beirut was boiling with creativity, but those creative talents had no support system whatsoever that would drive these talents and expose their work to a wider audience. What's very unique about Beirut, with the cultural diversities and the different religions, backgrounds and aesthetics, we are able to create shows where paradoxes come to life. Since founding House of Today in 2012, we have worked and brought together over 100 designers and artisans from different backgrounds and disciplines. The House of Today family, this growing and diversified community, continues to inspire our mission and commitment to contemporary design practices. We strive to maintain the long-term vision of keeping Lebanon on the design scene. House of Today has really given this international awareness of the value of Lebanese design. I mean, we had Lebanese designers, but there was no real togetherness. House of Today's annual scholarship program has been supporting exceptional students in their pursuit of higher degrees in design since 2015. Nurturing upcoming generation is a way to imagine a future with solid cultural heritage. 
Due to a lack of variety of design education in Lebanon, we help dedicated creatives study in renowned institutions and programs in Europe and in the USA. Beyond financial aid, we also help these young design thinkers with individual mentorships to empower them with the necessary tools. By mentoring, we empower our design community across disciplines and geographies. We foster a ground for dialogue to help develop a sustainable industry and design culture within a particularly challenging context. Our first Biennale in 2012, which actually marked the launch of House of Today, was devised in order to introduce designers to talented local craftsmen working in traditional methods to help foster a more cyclical local process. Some of the conversations were difficult, as artisans were rather inflexible in their ways and not willing to try something new. This lack of flexibility from their part forced us to produce abroad, so that designers create with no limitations. Once the artisans witnessed the exposure these designers achieved, they consequently became more flexible, responding to innovative techniques, which then allowed us to once again encourage production locally. Our platform continuously expanded by connecting Lebanese with local craftsmen, playing a pivotal role in building an ecosystem that fosters growth and sustainability. We further developed programs to include lectures, workshops and tours that introduce the design and production landscape of the country. House of Today has created a platform for young designers to have the chance to bring what they have out there. House of Today travels beyond the Biennale in Beirut by participating in exhibits, fairs, auction and design events. Whether helping place designer pieces in permanent museum collection or by mediating a private commission, House of Today is always looking to expand its reach and create collaborative multidisciplinary partnerships that foster cultural exchange to support its mission. It's a platform that will really help you go places you wouldn't even expect, and that's what's interesting. We got our first commissioned piece by House of Today. On August 4, 2020, Beirut witnessed one of the largest peacetime explosions in history, shattering a city and devastating its people. In the absence of a reliable government, we had to come together to support one another through grief and uncertainty. House of Today put together a relief program open to every designer in Beirut to help rebuild shattered studios. We have since had to devise different strategies to respond to the economic political barriers that have set a stagnant and debilitating landscape for designers to work. In light of the pandemic, House of Today launched the SOAP project, a creative initiative calling Lebanese designers and creative minds to rethink one of the most basic materials, the soap, from one of the most essential products to a new object of desire. For creatives to create, House of Today set up, as part of its relief initiative, a residency program abroad where environmental conditions are more conducive for the designers. Earlier this year, we initiated our first residency in collaboration with Arn Company for designer duo Sayyar and Kharibe and ceramist Marilyn Masoud to Anderson Ranch in Aspen to investigate new ceramic techniques. With 18th Street Art Center, we develop a partnership of ongoing intercultural dialogue. As part of their Borderless series, we created a documentary directed by Nadim Tabit that shows Beirut through the eyes of four designers. As of yesterday, Carlo and Marilyn Masoud are the visiting designers at the 18th Street Art Center in Los Angeles, allowing the siblings to explore and exchange in new territories. 
Not long ago, House of Today also sent Stefani Musellim to Naples to learn more about traditional Neapolitan crafts in collaboration with Edith Napoli. She will showcase the work inspired by this encounter in October as part of Edith Cult program with Fondazione Made in Cloister. Above and beyond residency, we are happy to announce that we will be present at Design Miami Curio with Khalid El Mais. We initiated the dialogue between Khalid and local Mexican craftsmen to create the New Nature Collection for House of Today. In the last decade, House of Today has actively and full-heartedly played a role towards gearing focus on Lebanese talent. Our designers are our cultural ambassadors to the world, painting a more positive facade of what our country has to offer. At this moment, our organization is trying to sustain a design culture of growth and exchange within this landscape to encourage creative expression and empower design culture as a contributing force for change. Though we know the path towards recovery for Lebanon is long, House of Today will continue to help foster an inspiring design scene to keep supporting our talent in Lebanon against all odds. And watching that footage of the shattered studios, I got very emotional. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you all felt the shiver that went through this audience. So it shows the power of what foundations and charities can do. Uh, but I don't want to dwell on negative. I'd like to try and keep this positive. And well, I've asked uh, everybody, you know, all the panel to think about an example from the last 18 months that they've found positive, you know, one lesson that maybe has enabled their foundation to grow or to move forward. So I'm going to start with you, Shireen. What one word or what experience, one, one example that you've taken from the last 18 months? Okay, so in Lebanon, it's a particular case. Uh, the last 18 months and way before that, uh, there was not much positives there. Um, COVID situation came secondary. Um, there's the political instability, there's the financial breakdown, uh, no government. So there's a lot of uh, pressure on the designers, on the community at large. Uh, to come out of this uh, with a positive outlook. However, uh, it was also a time where everyone came together. Uh, we got a lot of international support, moral support, um, and I think that was uh, a real turning point for Lebanon. It's such a small country, and uh, the tension we get usually is very... Uh, Minimal, so we got a very uh, a lot of support from everyone, which was great. In terms of House of Today and what we did, I think uh, there was a positive outlook there. Uh, we quickly um, tried to understand what the needs were of the designers. First of all, of course, we had to re-establish uh, their studios so they can start working again. And like we mentioned, it was really trying to take them out of their context uh, of misery. And I can't find a, a softer word. Uh, and and uh, do the residency program. And I think uh, that's again where with international com design community came together and they were really trying to uh, you know, uh, help out and uh, intervene. And uh, so that was really the positives mm. that we saw out of this. Um, well, I mean, we don't need to sugarcoat yes, for the purposes exactly. of I'm this talk. Yes, exactly. I'm trying to find positives, <laughs> but it's... Uh, but I, I think, you know, you're right. And it's how we sustain that, mm -hmm. that uh, energy and goodwill that's been generated. I wonder if, Nadia, I could turn to you and ask you the same question. You know, yeah. could you give me one, one example, one word of positive thoughts from the last 18 months? Okay, one word, connectivity. And I have to say, we all have had to get used to connecting with each other via Zoom or digitally. And even the new program, The Designers of Our Future, it is totally 
based on communicating digitally. It's totally international. And I don't think we would have been able to do that had we not gone through this crisis, you know? And I think I'm going beyond one word. No, <laughs> There's so much to say. But, you know, just from the uh, foundation point of view, I just find um, obviously human empowerment, equality is such a major issue. And I think if anything, this crisis has made us realize our common denominator with everyone. We are human. We are totally fragile. You know, we are all in the same position to get this COVID disease mm. or whatever. And I have to say, it's been amazing to see the outgoingness, the helpfulness, you know, that I've seen colleagues have towards each other, organizations have towards each other. It's been amazing. And I, I personally believe it was such a wake up call to the to man versus nature, man and nature. You know, we just are, I think people are just appreciate more, we're more appreciative of, of better air, you know, when the traffic stopped. Well, Najee, you've, you've, you've given me the perfect segue then to hand over to Cyril and answer the same question, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Um, I think the last year for us um, at Palais was all about discipline. You know, it's like, it was rough, to be honest. Um, we have like 100 plus employees all around the world and uh, you want to have them safe. Yeah, you want to make sure that they have work. You want to make sure that you are still out there fighting. You're still out there protecting animals under not the best circumstances. Um, and you're not on the priority list of, your, of the people that support you. You know, they are all anxious themselves. And um, we're working a lot with governments. Uh, fortunately, the World Bank has still uh, followed through with one of our big projects, one of the few that they have supported um, besides COVID-related uh, um, uh, measures. Uh, and Adidas has been extremely supportive um, despite their, their breakdown of their economy and lots of individuals, but it was a rough year for us. Mm -hmm. And I would say that the one word is really discipline, discipline, discipline. Um, learn to discipline yourself, not to work too much, get into balance, um, be efficient, um, use your resources well, um, don't lose yourself in endless Zoom calls. Um, and of course, um, when you and organize yourself better, which is not easy, you know, um, if you have to do everything remotely, because we depend on human interaction at Palais. Um, the upside is that we have done way more high caliber meetings in this, in this period of time than we would have usually done. And we did it all by Zoom. So it's accepted. Um, suddenly you're meeting a president or a minister or um, investors or big donors. Uh, you meet them by Skype, or not by Skype, actually, by Zoom uh, or FaceTime, and that's accepted now. So it's not any more expect expected from you that you have to show up all the time in person. Um, is so but it was a rough year um, for us so far, and I think it will stay rough for another year. Okay, well, let's try and keep it positive. Um, can, I, <laughs> can I ask you, Cyril, um, can you give me a real-time example of one of the developments that you have been involved with if, say, for example, a materials-based development, given the context of uh, where we're sitting in this talk? Yeah, I mean, first of all, we have driven our um, material development forward. Um, the original idea back then in 2012 was to take marine plastic pollution out of the oceans, uh, from rivers, from beaches, and declare it a premium material, upcycle it. And, and we are now able to make all kind of high-performance materials with it, um, be it 3D printing filaments, um, be it um, haute couture or pret a -potier or even sports um, fabric. Um, so this whole plastic thing we, we mastered um, and it's growing in, with the support of governments and of course um, uh, uh, companies, it's growing into a global end-to-end -end solution which gives local communities funding uh, and also capacity building in these countries. And the sec next big step for us is um, we started a very strong arm at Palais, which is going into new materials, identifying alternative materials. We have started that four years ago, but now it's completely organized. That means we are we're working with inventors, we're working with, with scientists, with re researchers, and even investors, you know, and, and supporting uh, people that are coming up with alternatives, alternatives to plastic, alternatives to leather, alternatives even to to chemicals that otherwise would be extremely devastating if they, they reach um, the environment. 
uh, and supporting these developments, um, even investing into them. Um, so it's really on one side dealing with the plastic crisis that are out there, doing the best we can on the ground and giving these materials a value in order to replace virgin plastic. And the second one is let's let these materials go for good. And that means we're inventing or supporting inventors um, in coming up with new materials. Cyril, your voice and is I think echoing. The success your... of the last 12 months was really uh, to form big alliances with governments and intergovernment organizations and investors. That is our success of the last actually 16 months. Yeah. I'm sorry to have interrupted you, but I was going to say that your no. voice is echoing around this hall, and I hope there's a few people out there listening. Um, <laughs> Nadja, I'm, I'm just I'm going to make this easy because we don't have much time. So, Nadja, can you just tell me one thing from the foundation or the uh, you know, creatives that really is exciting you? Just one example that we can all look forward to, real time. Um, like the latest uh, news. Can you say anything about the September announcement? Anything more? Yeah, I think again, and that is it's possible because again, it's digital. It will be digital. The students will present their um, programs, and um, I think it's exactly as Jill was saying, we'll see some very interesting new materials being used to have a positive impact. Great, great. And Shireen, what successes have you had post-explosion then with the rebuilding of the studio? Where are some of those designers now? Have they managed to rebuild their careers again, get things back on track? So we have... Uh uh, 12 designers back in their studios working. Uh, the residency programs have opened doors for many of the designers. Some of them have locked up uh, contracts with the uh, galleries, which is fantastic. We continue on showcasing the work since we cannot do the Biennale in Lebanon anymore, unfortunately. Uh, we continue with our efforts to exhibit and uh, work alongside and collaborate with international institutions. Um, and on a, we're, we're, we're participating, participating in design career with Khaled El Mays. I mean, the activities continue. Uh, we try to respond to the needs of the Lebanese people at any specific time, depending on their needs. Yeah, so I guess communication, collaboration, networks, Absolutely. you know, we all have to respond rather fast. But talking of fast, 45 minutes went too quickly. Mm -hmm. I apologize to the speakers. I didn't give you nearly enough opportunity to get messages across, but I'm sure the, the Salone website for this talk will also give the contact details for all of the foundations. Um, so can I just say thank you? Uh, can you all join me in uh, giving my speakers a round of applause? Thank you. And uh, we'll hopefully see you all in real life again very soon. All right. Goodbye. Exactly. Thank Thanks for having us. Bye. 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 Take care. Thank you.